Hey, everybody. It's going to be a wicked episode today. It's not every day we get to introduce our viewers and listeners to a former CIA spy, like legitimate former CIA spy. And uh, we found out he's also one of the co-founders of To The Stars Academy. So I don't know about you, Jay, but I'm super pumped. This has been a long time in the making uh, and I'm ready to rock. And uh, let's hear what this guy's got to say. So let's do it. Let's do it. Welcome back to another episode of UAP Studies Podcast. My name is Louis Borges. Joining me as always, my good friend and co-host, Jason Gilman. How's it going? It's going really well. I'm super excited. Uh, I can say this is a first for us on our show. We have a former CIA spy, legitimate CIA spy, great guy as well, and uh, a gentleman who also knows a lot about the field of UAPs and uh, has transitioned from one career into another uh, I mean, this gentleman had a 25-year distinguished career within the CIA, uh, retired in 2007. Uh, he also worked with the uh, National Clandestine Service. I mean, that says spy all over it. You're a clandestine <laughs> member. And, uh, you know, at the time of his uh, retirement, he was a member of the uh, Senior Intelligence Service. Uh, he's held many senior management positions uh, with, at head office at CIA headquarters, um, and also the recipient of the agency's Career Intelligence Medal, I could go on for hours, but without further ado, we want to welcome to the show, Mr. Jim Semivan. Hello, Louis. Hi, hi, Jason. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on. We're super happy to have you on. Uh, we've been jacked about this for a couple of weeks since we know you've been here. Uh, we usually don't release our coming soon episode until the week of. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we have a small bubble of people that are into this thing. And it's been Jason and I and maybe two other guys that are like, oh, my God, we got Jim Semivan coming on the show. <laughs> Most other people have no clue who we are or you are or anybody exactly. else. Exactly. Exactly. This, this show is for the people that are really into this subject. As our, our viewers know, we're very fact based and on point. We look for credentials and they don't get any bigger or better than yours. So yeah. uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and then sort of your career in the CIA. And then uh, we can transition into what you're working on today. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm pretty uh, general existence. I mean, I was born in Ohio. Uh, I was a paper boy, an altar boy, raised Catholic, um, uh, went to uh, you know undergraduate at Ohio State University, and then graduate school at San Francisco State University, where I majored in uh, English literature with a concentration on uh, British and American transcendentalism slash romanticism. Um, uh, I worked all kinds of jobs, restaurant industry, bartending, running restaurants, things along those lines, and then uh, I. Um, got involved uh, with the CIA recruitment process while I was in San Francisco and um, moved uh, to, got accepted and then moved into uh, uh, the agency in 1982. Uh, subsequently, about 10 months afterwards, got married and then went over to my first assignment um, in the Middle East. Um, I spent a couple of years there, uh, then came back and then a variety of jobs, uh, uh, both in the United States throughout the United States and um, uh, overseas. My last assignment, overseas assignment, was uh, was in Europe, Western Europe. And then I came back and um, got into the uh, senior ranks of CIA and um, held positions there. Um, I, and it wasn't, a, and, I, and I went back, I, I retired in 2007, I took about nine, 10 months off, went back for a year to work with the director of CIA on a, on a, on a uh, project he had going on. And then subsequently worked uh, for 12 more years after that as a private contractor, an independent contractor working for our directorate of uh, science and technology. Uh, and then I think I left completely about three years ago. I think I still hold my clearances, um, but I, I don't know. I haven't checked. It's not that important anyway. So uh, to me, at least not anymore, but um and then I met Tom DeLong um, in uh, 2000. The dates are a little squishy here for me. I apologize. Uh, 2015, maybe 2016. 
Um, uh, and Tom and I formed a company to the stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is now called to the stars Inc to the stars incorporated. Uh, we restructured uh, about a year ago um, uh, and went to the SEC. We're a public benefit corporation. So um, we have to give, we do give, you know, 10, 15% of our, any profits we make uh, to um, uh, charitable organizations, uh, organizations that, uh, you know, uh, help other people, things along those lines. Uh, and hopefully in the future, once our company kicks off, we'll have more money to throw at the UAP phenomenon. So, uh, and that's pretty much where I am now. So what was the, the reason for removing the Academy from TTSA? We, uh, well, you know, we, we had, when we first started to the stars, um, it was myself, Tom, Hal Putoff, and two other gentlemen who I will not name. Uh, um, they prefer not, they're very well known. You would know them. Uh, and uh, we were all having lunch in San Diego at a hotel. And uh, Tom suggested we all join him in this new organization he was uh, putting together. And um, all of us pretty much declined uh, initially. And uh, we weren't interested. And because he was, mostly into entertainment, doing things along those lines. And uh, uh, so we, uh, and I, we said no. And he said, well, what, what would you, what would make you, what would entice you to start one with, with, with me? And so I, I told him, I said, you know, I, we're all pretty much interested in researching the phenomenon. We're not really interested in the other side, the entertainment side all that much. Um, and so he said, well, what would it look like? So I got a cocktail napkin and I s sketched it out. We can do the entertainment side. That's what, going to make the money if you know but then we'll do a research side um and uh he agreed right right off the bat so uh the other two gentlemen had had really truly had way too many commitments to get involved in this but hal put off on myself immediately agreed and we formed the company uh but when we formed it um we had about 15 or 16 r d projects um that we were very excited about uh that we brought in um some of them, um, you know, we had the I owned the IP for and other ones we didn't, but nevertheless, we're able to use the technology um, deemed electron propulsion, things along those lines, uh, space time metric, dealing with space time metric. But that required an enormous sum of money to do that. And uh, we uh, had some private funding lined up. And as you know, we're since we were. Uh, uh, we had uh, we filed with the SEC. We had a lot of investors. We have about four thousand investors now, um, but we were looking for. They were small mom and pop investors, which was fine. That's what we wanted. We wanted to have them there. Um, but uh, we had some uh, pretty big time investors sort of lined up there, and then all of a sudden the pandemic hit. And uh, I mean, we had a crater with the army uh, to research some you know meta materials that we had, and 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 everything just collapsed. So uh, luckily we had a marketing arm, you know, this sold t-shirts, things along those lines, and that was doing reasonably well. So we were able to stay afloat, but a lot of our funding sort of disappeared. Um, even the army who was working with us at the time said, look, we can't even get people to come in and research this. So everything was on hold for a couple of years. And then we decided, look, you know, we're having a hard time trying to get money for some of the funding on the R&D projects. So we decided to actually put them on the back burner and said, look, why don't we just focus on what we're going to, what we can make some money on for our investors. Uh, and that's the entertainment side. And then we will keep the R&D side. But once we get some money flowing in and if investors start coming in in a large way, we can certainly go back to that. I mean, that's all, it's all set up and ready to go. It's just a question of getting the funds to do it. So we we anticipated, you know, a lot more uh, private investment from more more people, but it is we found out this is a sort of a niche community, isn't it? I mean, you know, oh, it's, small, yeah. it's not that big, uh, and a lot of people don't have a lot of money. Yeah, it's totally understandable. So, you know, our, our first our first goal is, you know, to, for the investors, we don't want the investors to lose their money. So we, you know, we said, okay, we're going to stay afloat the best way we can, and we're going to have a goal is, you know, is, is get a return on the dollar for our, our, our investors here. And also as important, I think even to the investors is figure out what the hell this phenomenon is. And uh, so we're working on that. So we recently signed a deal with uh, legendary pictures, you know, the ones who just did Dune. Nice. Uh, they're going to take the secret machines fiction trilogy and hopefully turn it into a 
television series or a movie. Um, so they have a two year option, I think, on that. Uh, we sold uh, just recently a, uh, an animated series has nothing to do with UAP. Uh, it was one of these ideas Tom and this other guy came up with. I thought it was really crazy. It's called Breaking Bear. <laughs> about some bears who become drug lords, you know, sort of like break a takeoff on Breaking Bad. Breaking but Bad, it was, yeah. uh, Purchased by Tubi, a streaming service. And then we have about a dozen other entertainment projects all lined up. And we have writers and uh, screenplays are being done. And uh, so we're real excited about that. Hopefully in the near future, we'll have some more stuff. And so that's why we decided to change the name to To The Stars Inc. It just was... We yeah. wanted to get rid of the Academy of Arts and Sciences because the science part to sort of downplay that for the time being, although it's not going anywhere. So th that's sort of up to date what we've been up to. So what got you into the whole field of UAPs? I mean, I'm sure many people in the CIA probably don't speak about that openly if they're into that sort of thing. So did you have an experience or, you know, what got you from a, you know, a staunch guy with lots of credentials to want to come forward and say, yeah, I'm into this. And I think we should look at it a little deeper. That's a good question. I, I, um, uh, I think as I explained before on a couple other podcasts, I uh, always had a, a deep interest in the esoteric. Uh, my older brother who passed away recently was a, a, a big influence on my life. And I, uh, uh, I got very interested in uh, Western mysticism and then later on Eastern mysticism and then romanticism, uh, 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 German romanticism actually at the time and, and uh, uh, started studying Emerson, Thoreau uh, and Western mystery schools, Greek mystery schools, Roman mystery schools, things along those lines. But in about 90 to, we're not, my wife and I aren't 100% sure of the exact day, but it's probably around 91, 92. We had a, an experience um, uh, that happened to us. And uh, I, I don't really talk about it in any great detail. I did a full presentation on it at a, at a, at a think, tank, think tank with a, a group of scholars uh, about six months ago. And we all were sharing it, uh, sharing our experiences together. But um, I'm, I'm not ready to, to talk about it. I don't call it an abduction experience. I just call it really what it is. Uh, I think it's, it's an experience. I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, so that got me uh, more interested in UAPs and this whole concept around it. Uh, a friend of mine at work found out about what happened to me and my wife and uh, recommended books by Jacques Vallée. I read those, uh, and then it wasn't until 2014 that I ran into, um, uh, this is sort of the shortened version, of John Alexander, uh, who's just a wonderful man, uh, uh, and he was uh, he was sort of A-tip before A-tip, okay? He was a okay. guy in the Pentagon, right? He's a wonderful guy and his dear friend, and uh, I ran into him. My wife and I ran into him at an energy conference. I healing energy conference up in new york and uh, we became friends and he uh, uh we uh, we had some material from the experience uh, he came down to our house interviewed my wife and, my, and myself and um took it back to a darpa lab and um the and the experience in the videotape and then a couple of weeks later um that's when sort of all hell broke loose. We, you know, Jacques Belay came out to my house and, you know, and spent the day with us. He's just oh, wow. truly wonderful man. And, yeah. uh, and then uh, we, <laughs> then we had um, people come over to our house and uh, so, like I said, these, these people now are very well known in the community and uh, took blood samples and things along those lines, took our medical records and I happened to have kept them all. And, and then, um, and then, not too long after that, um, I had uh, briefings uh, on a classified level uh, by again people that you would you would know um, um, at CIA, and that uh, sort of took me from uh, being a sort of a amateur investigator. You know, I've never been an investigator. I take that back. This is an amateur. Um, uh, enthusiast yeah and and uh that sort of changed everything so uh and that's uh when i became uh uh 
convinced uh, that um, totally 110 uh, percent convinced and assured that what uh, not what I had experienced, but what was being experienced uh, by other people and particularly uh, by the military was real, was very real. And uh, and then at that point, um, I was introduced to Lou Elizondo at the Pentagon, uh, met with him numerous times and his staff uh, to discuss this. Uh, and uh, and then one thing led to another. And, um, you know, to my surprise, one day Lou said, "You know, I, I'm I'm, I'm going to I'm going to resign," and and um, so I, I quickly introduced him to Tom, and then he, Lou joined uh, TTSA, as did uh, Chris Mellon, uh, who came sort of. Uh, Tom, had, I think I called Chris and asked him some questions, and Chris joined up, and then Steve Justice did from, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the, uh, you know, uh, from Lockheed Skunk Works. And uh, so it, it, it all happened very quickly. Uh, and uh, we decided we were going to do that. And Lou was able to get the um, the three films, um, three film clips declassified uh, or un yeah, yeah, declassified. And um, so a lot of the data that was associated with it was taken away. Uh, the top secret stuff was taken away uh, and you were left with what you were left with. And we were shortened versions of the video. But um, and then afterwards, you know, everything sort of went forward with Congress. I sort of uh, started doing the briefings at uh, some CIA and DNI and other places to let them know we were going public with this. And uh, it was met rather well uh, by all concerned. I mean, I said, we're not going to let any classified information out the door. I said, but at the same time, this doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't belong to any government. And, mm -hmm. and, and so we were, we were, we have to go private. So they, they were fine, you know, keep us posted. So we have, we still have links, you know, with them. And I still have links with the task force and stuff along those lines, um, as does Lou and Chris. So, um, and that's sort of where we ended up. And that's where I am today. I, I don't, I don't take a very prominent role. I chose not to, uh, it may change. It may not change. Actually, I'm thinking of pulling back a little bit. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't like being front and center. And I think I've said all I really want, want to say. I don't know. I, I, I apologize in a way. I, I hope I don't end up, I'm, I'm, well, I'm going to end up repeating myself in a lot of this stuff uh, with you guys, but it's mostly been said before, but that's yeah. sort of where I am now. But Quick we question on very, very long winded. I apologize. <laughs> I want to ask you on the three videos, because we've had people say, well, we don't know if that was the only footage. Was there more? Was there enhanced footage? We had Sean Cahill on the show and he yeah. was the master sergeant of arms of the USS Princeton that got the footage. He's also a very good friend of Lou Elizondo. And he had said, I, I've seen a higher definition version yeah. than you have. So you kind of touched on that there that, you know, it's a, an edited version. So there is a larger clip with more detail to those three videos that we all know so well. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many, many more videos as, uh, as Lewis pointed out, I think numerous times and those videos, many of those videos plus other information were presented to Congress. Yeah. And I, I think, I think Congress was uh, really taken aback right. when, when they saw this. I was, uh, and uh, I mean, it was it was very apparent um, that um, that we're we're not alone, and there is something else out there. Now, the problem is, you know, it's and, uh, this was said by I, I think I don't know if Jock said this or Ted Holliday said this in the Goblin Universe, but it was a, a quote, something along the lines of, you know, the, 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 the there's plenty of evidence, right, pointing to this. Uh, the problem is there isn't a theory to explain the evidence. So, you know, that's sort of where we are with this right now. Uh, I alluded to this once, uh, you know, saying that there's no there there. There's no ontology. Uh, there's no place we can go to and say, oh, it fits into this. We think uh, it may fit into as Lou, you know, mentioned before that I had asked him once, I said, what do you think this falls? And he said, probably in the nexus between um, consciousness and quantum mechanics, somehow in there, and we might begin to find an explanation. Yeah. And I think he's probably correct in that. Um, uh, but, you know, and a lot of people are studying it now. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, 
we'll start finding more um, uh, 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 signals in the noise, so to speak. But yeah, yeah, Sean, Sean is correct um, about that. You know, I like the idea from one of your partners, Hal Putoff. It's sort of the ultra terrestrial. So as you mentioned, like we all have theories, but there's no real set of rules to test and measure and, you know, see if it can stand on its own two legs. So the ultra terrestrial just kind of encompasses everything. Maybe it's not aliens or interdimensional beings or, you know, cryptids or something else. Maybe it's a little bit of everything and they're all coexisting or they're all somehow interrelated. And as you mentioned, quantum mechanics, you know, the deeper you go down the rabbit hole on this thing, even career pros like George Knapp, who've been doing this like 30 years, they used to be nuts and bolts UFO guys. And now they're like, it's just a lot more to this. You know, they had some weird hitchhiker effects. They called them uh, from Skinwalker Ranch orbs and, you know, things they brought home with their family and their wives saw it. And, and they don't even want to talk about it themselves. And you'd think as enthusiasts, they'd be dying to tell the story. But when weird stuff happens, it's real and it's not a joke. And both Jason and myself have had some weird things happen. You know, we weren't abducted by little green men, but enough to know that there's more going on than we fully understand. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's a really good point, uh, Louis. The, you know, you have to sort of sort of stand back a little bit. I, I mean, I'd like to thank, you know, uh, guys like George and call him Kelleher and Bob Bigelow, Eric mm -hmm. Davis, you know, John Alexander. These are the guys that were initially involved with NIDS, you know, National Institute for yeah. Discovery Science. And then later on the BAS program uh, and uh, who were working for DIA at the time. And um, the, the they were the ones I, I, I think in the end basically came out and solidified this idea that it's not just about nuts and bolts, that there's a lot more associated with it. And yeah. You you see that in 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 the Gillibrand Amendment, you know, to the National Defense Security Act, uh, um, and twenty two, where they were talking about you know um, biological psychological effects of this, and it just isn't all nuts and bolts. There's a lot more to it. So Jim Lekatsky, who originally ran the ATIP program, these are the guys I think are the the pioneers. You know, Nap Lekatsky, Bigelow, you know. Davis, these guys are, uh, you know, Hal, John, John Alexander. These are the guys that pretty much set everything up for what I call the real totality of, of, of the phenomena. And, uh, of course, to, to guys like me, you know, uh, who were sort of briefed on some of this beforehand. And it's surprising a lot of the stuff that was briefed to me in the classified setting is now unclassified. <laughs> uh, and it's being talked about out there. Holy cow. Well, OK, well, you know, that, that's fine. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very, very strange phenomenon and, uh, I, I wish to hell I knew where to go with it. I, I um, yeah. I don't, I mean, there are many times I, I want to walk away and because I just, uh, I just don't know where to turn. I mean, I, <coughs> you, you always, but there's always a fascinating new book that comes out. Yeah. And, uh, then yes, what was it? That fellow, is his name Masters or Paul, yeah, Michael, Michael Paul, Paul Masters. Masters. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He was on what a, a few weeks book. ago. We had him on our show. You had him great on, guy. yeah, yeah, great guy. What a wonderful book! I just heard him on Coast to Coast uh, not too long ago, and uh, uh, I think I connected with him once on LinkedIn or someplace. And uh, uh, absolutely fascinating guy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I he's an he anthropologist. Very, very yeah, he's used to looking at bones and you know dinosaurs and things like that. So there's not too many old age guys that are really interested in new age. I mean, some of them want to connect the dots and imply that everything was aliens, but. You know, there's popular TV programming based on that exact uh, premise, you know, but it was interesting yeah. to get his uh, his uh, take on it as a scientist, a doctor, essentially. And he basically said that if you take what we used to look like, fast forward to what we look like now and then keep that going. Eventually, our heads continue to grow our arms. You know, we're not hunting for food and foraging anymore. So we lose our muscle mass. Our jaws are shrinking. Maybe that causes some type of an eye protrusion because of the big head and the small jaw. He theorized we're basically gray aliens in a million years anyway, if you just follow the natural evolution of things. So very interesting perspective. What was his, uh, is it ultra tempestrial is what he said, uh, Jason? Extra tempestrial Extra model. tempestrial. So no, time right. travelers from the future yeah we've just come back to harvest genetic material or something else that we're not sure about but and this is what's really important about this uh about this subject area is is getting new and interesting theories in here mm -hmm. uh, to discuss yeah. them all 
I know, um, you know, the the task force, and there's not just one. There's probably a couple of task force, and and because um, any <laughs> any time there's money to be had by Congress, trust me, everybody wants to start a task force. Um, you know, they, I think most of them because it, and this is the, one of the reasons why we we really wanted to go private is why TTS was started. Um, because it was just we knew that the government was really focusing on one thing and that's national defense that's what it's supposed to be doing that's what the intelligence community does so what happens is um everybody's you know gets very high expectations at all oh, isn't this great you know we're going to get congress is going to get all these these reports you know from the military and from the ic talking about no, no. I mean, they're going to get something, but they're not going to get uh, they're not going to get the family jewels here. And 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 because if they deem it to be a national security issue, and believe me, it is uh, a, a lot of it is, um, and 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 it has nothing to do. By the way, it just has everything to do with other countries, not not just right, not just us. I mean, you know, if I don't think the government knows it damn thing about what the phenomenon is to be honest with you i just don't i i don't i, don't, I haven't I have, seen yeah i often said that i don't think that yeah, they know exactly what they're doing yeah but they are focusing on the nuts and bolts and and you know when they have been focusing on you know for years decades on the paranormal stuff you know you know and and uh and i'm sure they're still doing that uh but i, I don't think they've come to any kind of conclusions um i was uh you know i was at cia when when uh, I was up on the seventh floor, uh, I was a special assistant uh, to uh, the deputy director of operations at the time when the uh, uh, remote viewing program was canceled. And I remember uh, reading about the remote viewing program and knowing a little bit of what it was about. And I remember talking to the fellow that ran the program. He was a very senior guy there and he became a friend of mine. And, and I asked him, I said, what the hell did you guys why did you cancel that? And he said, he said, we, we, we couldn't use it in an intelligence assessment. So in other words, and it's the same problem. You know, it's, it's plenty of evidence to prove that it works and it did work and very successfully worked. Uh, the problem is you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't explain it. And as he pointed out to me, he said, if you tried to use that in an intelligence assessment and say you took it to the president, Say the Russians were developing, you know, a new missile or a new submarine or new new radar facility, and somebody, you know, went in uh, and and you know, got a glimpse of what it was, and maybe even went into the files and all this kind of stuff, and had all this great information, and then you even corroborated that to a certain extent. If the president asks you, uh, "Where did you get this information?" and you say, "Well, some." some guy or some woman went out on their silver cord and, you know, they, they, they just popped into this place and took a picture with their mind's eye and came back and described it to us. And that's not going to fly. Uh, and that's not going to fly with anybody. And so I think they realized that. I don't think it went away. I think it's still being looked at um, uh, simply because it, it, it works. Not everybody out. does it well, but then there are some people like Ingo Swan and Joe McGonigal and some of these other ones who are just absolutely amazing at it. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, all, these old programs, you know, it's they they look like they've gone away, but most of the time they're not because you can't afford to lose sight of those, particularly if you know that your adversaries are, are still investigating this. You can't allow them to get one up on you. So, Jim, one of the questions that I, I uh, ask a couple of guests is, and I'm really interested in finding out what you think of this, but, um, you know, we've got these new committees, these new groups that are supposed to be investigating whenever something happens, you know, they show up and they'll do their thing. Are they still competing against the organizations that were sort of clandestine at the time? Because, you know, when you hear about the, the TikTok incidents and stuff like that, you're saying that within 20 minutes, uh, two civilian looking guys show up in a helicopter, take the, the tapes and then, you know, take off. Are they going to be basically butting heads with this, you know, organizations? Or are they sort of, you think, are going to step back and allow Congress to, you know, and their own organization, their own uh, in basically research to take over or do you think you're still going to have some some issues there well, let me let me explain it this way in 1947 
and again in 1952. But in 47, the Air Force made it very, very clear that UFOs were real and that there was something there that right. they couldn't explain. And they also said, we're going to study this. OK, now in 1952, CIA came out and said the same thing. The DCI, the Director of Central Intelligence, came out and said, look, we can't explain it. We don't think this is a, a national security threat at all, but clearly something's something's amiss. There's something out there that we can't explain. Now, the CIA was formed uh, in 1947 because they didn't want another. Nobody, the United States did not want another Pearl Harbor. Right. So the CIA's charter basically states that they're they are supposed to lead the intelligence community in figuring out, you know, very serious problems. In other words, you you know whether they're if they even have a remote tr uh, truthfulness about it, that's what they're supposed to do. Now they can devote a million dollars to it, and they can devote a hundred million dollars to it. It all depends. But I, I'm assuming here, and I'm not going to you know get into any more details that um, it would have been it would have been highly unlikely or it well, it is highly unlikely that either the Air Force or the CIA have not had programs going on for the last 70 or 80 years. So let's just posit that for a second because uh, it, it would make no sense to me otherwise, particularly if they knew the Russians had one. And we all know the Russians did. George Knapp came out, you know, in 1991 with Red 3, right? And, uh, and those were legitimate documents. Yeah, he smuggled them out of Russia, so he knows they're real because he got the bloody documents, right? He, he got them from the there. yeah, he got it from the or KGB. Right. And I, he's never really did, I don't think discussed the complete story on that. I would love to hear it someday. He did on our yeah. show. He basically told us the whole thing how he went there and started bringing them back, and he made a few trips, and they he gave it all over to the government, and they contacted yeah. him after his first book. Uh, I think it had to do with skinwalkers or something like that. But ever since that, he uh, he had been feeding them what he was able to to scrounge up himself. And this is pre 9-11. So it's not as big an espionage thing as it would be today to do the same thing, you know, but exactly. Exactly. Uh, but but if you, when you look at examples like that, you know, it, it, it's like uh, in, you know, in uh, the, the realm of uh, parapsychology or, or, you know, or, you know, psychic phenomena. If you knew that the Russians were working on psychokinesis or telepathy in some form, and you knew that they're doing it solely because they want to weaponize it in some form, you know, is the reason why MK Ultra was was yeah. there in CIA in the 60s and 70s. You know, how could we how can we use psycho, um, uh, you know, psychedelics to basically control the human mind? And or can we do that? Uh, and I think that was resoundingly um, proven that you really can't. Um, uh, and it, it was an awful, awful thing. Uh, and so glad it went away, but, uh, it wasn't the CIA's finest hour for by any stretch of the imagination. And, uh, but you can't ignore that. You, you don't ignore that. Um, uh, um, this is how weapon systems works. If you know that an adversary has a weapon system, uh, and you know, pretty much you steal the information for the weapon system. Now, you know what it is. So you can develop countermeasures. So they find out that you stole that. Now they do have countermeasures to your countermeasures. Now you have to steal that. And this is this is how this is how this works. And it never ends. It, yeah. it goes on like this all the time. So imagine, you know, UFO activity, uh, particularly over uh, uh, sensitive nuclear sites. Uh, the, you know, the, despite what what was said in the 50s, 60s, and 70s by the Air Force and the intelligence community about UFOs and what the terrible the thing, you know, that the uh, DOD, I think, and the IC did to the people who witnessed this and basically made them look like idiots and fools. Mm -hmm. That was an awful thing. Uh, and uh, because these people were telling the truth. Yeah. And, and, the, and, they, and the military and the IC knew it was the truth. Absolutely knew it was the truth. Uh, but they were they were afraid. They were afraid to, to draw any attention to it whatsoever. They did not want, the Air Force did not want, nor did the CIA want. I mean, they've come out and said this. We didn't want any attention. We didn't want people to get all excited about this because we didn't know how to answer it. This goes back to the, you know, the idea of UFOs and sovereignty, that wonderful paper that was written by Alexander Wenton. I can't remember the other fellow's name from Ohio State. It's, uh, uh, you know, if you haven't read it, it's, it's well worth reading. And uh, because what do you do 
through the president of the United States uh, or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and your main goal is the protection of the people of the United States, and someone comes up to you and you have information that basically you can't explain. Yes, there are things in this world or of this world or around this world that can interfere you know, with our, our one of the tri- – I can interfere with all three parts of the triad you know, of, of nuclear defense and can shut it down at will and or you know show up at these places at will and we can't do anything about it yeah you can't defend the people so is the president supposed to come out and actually admit that yeah uh and i think there was a lot of discussion that was going on in the 60s up until probably the 90s and if not later uh, on this topic what do you say what do you say to the public about this and well, it- um yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it's interesting because, you know, here we are on, you know, the civilians uh, thinking, what does the CIA know about this? What does the, the you know, Department of Defense know about this? And you guys are experiencers as well. I mean, you experienced something while you were in, in you know, hired by, yeah, you were with it, the CIA yeah, and you, yeah. you experienced something. And that to me is is huge. That is a you know part of disclosure, as far as I'm concerned, is people from the military and the uh, interior defense, you know, CIA coming out and saying, you know what, yeah, this stuff happens to us too. We don't know how to handle this. Um, a mutual friend of ours once I asked him, is said, you know, is there really a threat narrative here? Because we've talked to people that had experiences with uh, these entities, and they seem quite happy with the results of the experience or they got tucked in back into bed while others have a more traumatic experience. Um, but when it comes down to it, uh, you know, people are take being taken at night and there's, you know, there's nothing really, or during the day, it depends on the s- scenario and story you hear, but there's nothing really that anybody can do about it. Like you can't send jets out to intercept. You can't even pick them up on radar. Uh, do you think there's a threat narrative to this, like from your experience? Um, I, I, you know, this is one of the hits that TTSA took very early on that we were somehow propounding this theory that, um, you know, that this, that the, um, the phenomenon itself or UAPs in itself were a threat. And we really weren't saying that at all. What we were saying, and we still continue to say, and I, I still continue to believe is that as a national security issue, we have to view it as a threat until we understand what it is. Right. Um, or we have to view it as a potential threat until we know what it is. Now, is it a threat, an existential threat? No, I, 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 I don't think so at all. It's been around for over 2000 years in mean, recorded history. Nothing's, nothing too serious have happened. I mean, people have gone missing. Um, people have gotten sick. You know, I was part of a, I still am part of a cohort group, uh, you know, started five or six years ago. Um, actually, a little bit longer than that. Uh, we're studying the effects of people's experiences with the phenomenon. And it was mostly relegated to senior government officials. I don't want to get too much detail about this. A lot of it is HIPAA restricted. And, um, but I, I saw the, saw the, um, uh, PowerPoints on this and what happens to people that run into this. This was talked about in the Skinwalker books quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and so people do do get harmed uh, by it. I, I, I viewed what happened to me and my wife as a, um, a human rights violation of the highest order. Uh, right. You know, it, 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 it hurt my wife and um, it did physical. I mean, it didn't do physical damage. Well, I had physical damage. But it, it didn't seem to affect me. I mean, you know, um, over the long term, I was I was fine, uh, uh, according to well, as far as I know. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, I didn't gain any um, any uh, you know special knowledge. Uh, I didn't become a nicer, kinder person. I always had a very open outlook. So to me. I was sort of mad uh, and I still am to, you know, to, to a little, well, to a greater extent, what the hell were you doing? You know, what the hell did I do? What did I do to you? Yeah. And, and why did you do that? Why did you harm, harm my wife? And uh, you know, and I, I have, I don't have a satisfactory, a satisfactory, satisfactory explanation for that. 
Uh, now you got one of my dear friends, Chris Bledsoe, and I always mention him because I just think he's about as the real deal as you can possibly get. Um, you know, met him numerous times, heard his story in great detail. And here is the almost the the opposite of my experience, extremely terrifying for him and his son in the beginning and the people that were with him in the beginning took an enormous toll on him, both him and his family and his wonderful family. I mean, you it really, if you had to describe the quintessential loving family, that's the Bledsoe family. They are just wonderful people. And you look at him and what he went through and then how this has turned out for him is, is um, really uh, wonderful. He, you know, he's, He's a healer. Um, he has a completely rejiggered view of reality and spirituality. And um, um, and he's a, if you ever talk to him, he's just a, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful, loving, compassionate, kind man. Right. And it really did change him. It changed him, he thinks, too, for the better. I don't know if he could have gotten any better than he was before because he was always that way, people who knew him. But nevertheless, um, he, he had a, also a physical rejuvenation. He had Crohn's disease and he got cured of that. Uh, that doesn't mean he's going to live forever and he doesn't have other, uh, you know, other physical issues, but nevertheless. So I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it's when you talk to George, you know, and Calm Kelleher and, you know, and, and Bigelow and these guys and, and, and even, and Lou will tell you too. I mean, you have, it's, if you go looking for it and you walk into its, its, its lair, you know, or wherever the hell it's there. The intent may not be there to harm you, <clears throat> but if you're walking into it, you're going to get harmed. Mm -hmm. And this is what the problem with the hitchhiker effect is. So, I mean, I look at that and you look at Axelrod, you know, the guy Axelrod, I, I, he's a great guy and I know him very well. But, you know, you look at what it did to his family and uh, a lot of it's been publicized, but a lot of it hasn't either. And um, he, um, I mean, scaring his children with the, you know, the tall wolf, you know, on the hind legs and all this kind of stuff. I just don't see, I mean, what I see there is that, is that, uh, that uh, you know, proverbial trickster element that you get to it, you know, uh, and it has to do with, uh, you know, daimonic reality in general. There's always been a trickster element to it. It lies to you, just like the gods, quote unquote, lied to you and teased you. <clears throat> you get that in the Bible, all throughout the Bible. Uh, so there's an element there of um, of trickery and deceit. Uh, there's an element there of compassion, understanding. Um, and there's an element there, a much, much smaller element, I think, of evil. Uh, or what we would consider evil uh, from our anthropomorphic point of view. Uh, but maybe to them it isn't. I, I don't know. It just is, it just, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's Whitley Strieber described it as walking through a forest of hypotheses, you know, <laughs> you, know you don't know where the hell you are. I mean, you're walking through it. And go, oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. You know, and, and I don't know. It's the same with the UAP topic. Everybody, unfortunately, gets an equal plate at the table because nobody has definitive proof. Nobody has anything that hasn't been beat to death as well. Maybe it's this or maybe it's that. So until something solid comes out, everybody's opinion has equal value. I mean, like we tend to have our, our own favorites of where we side in our own independent bias, but really, you know, crazy or not, we don't know. And nobody knows for sure. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the only thing I, I don't care for is, uh, you know, on this topic is one of the reasons I try to stay away from symposiums and conferences is um, although some of them are getting better is, the amount of people that that are there that are speakers there you can have maybe three or four speakers that i think really have some solid foundations and then you can have three or four or five of them that are just um you know I, and again and not i don't want to criticize them simply because like, like you said louie i i don't know either but if you come out and you tell me that you know yeah that's a problem that's now I have a hard time with that because you don't know this is real. You don't know what's real and what the uh, ultimate intentions are or exactly what they are or where they come from. And I, I, I think um, it's, it's like the government and disclosure. I mean, the hell are we? I, I'm not waiting for the government to come out with anything. I, I mean, the government doesn't own this. The government is, has this one narrow look at this, and that's national defense. That's all it cares about. It doesn't care about anything else. 
they're not going to start a UFO philosophy institute or you know you know uh, you know or anything like that you know like the World Peace Foundation. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen privately if it happens at all. Yep. It should happen privately. And I don't know why it hasn't. We've been trying to get enough you know benefactors to come in and actually create an organization where you can actually look at this. It happens to everybody around the world. It happens to ordinary people, normal people, not just the military and intelligence officers or military installations. It happens more, more so, you know, with the general population. But we haven't been able to get, uh, pull together. I think we're just, just disparate roads everybody's going down yeah. and or everybody's trying to do it. I mean, you know, uh, Abby Loeb, you know, is doing his Galileo project. I know Stephen Greer has his own project and NASA. You know, Na yeah, NASA's yeah. steady and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, they're all sort of in the end, you know, looking sort of at the same thing, trying to figure out what this is. Some have their preconceived notions uh, about what it may be. But I think we need something that's a lot more. Um, it has a lot more academic disciplines associated with it. We need religious scholars. We need, you know, social psychologists. We need regular psychologists. We need, well, not regular psychologists, but clinical psychologists. Uh, you know, we need physicists. Um, we need anthropologists, um, sociologists uh, to actually be looking at this together. Trained um, observers. Thank you. And trained observers. And somebody with a Zen mind, you know, somebody with a clear mind that doesn't know a damn thing about this you throw them in because we need perspectives we need women we need men you know we need uh, the dalai lama to help us figure this out he could do it i'm sure he may be able to i don't know he meditate he, once he, and he'd tell us everything we need to know well he he's he mentioned this a, a few times and he said oh yeah don't 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 worry about them they're just pesky you know they're just they just bother Seriously. you to try to take you away and you know and uh, i i um I'm I'm a big fan of uh, you know the the two people I follow uh, probably religiously on this are um, well actually three that I consider real well, more than that actually about a dozen but my my top three are always going to be Jacques Vallee yeah. and then Jonathan Keel or John Keel and um, and lately as of late Jeff Kripal Dr Jeff Kripal from Rice University religious scholar I I and then Whitley Strieber too. These these uh, guys and and how I mean you, you can sort of start naming them Sturrock, um, Bullard. These are the guys I think that that really seriously thought about this and um, um, uh, are looking at it from the perspective of uh, you know what it might be. And I, you know, if I have to, if I come to any kind of like conclusions lately and not even conclusions just my own personal feelings and this would probably change next week by the way because it, it seems to always do that <laughs> is this phenomenon reminds me more or less of the gin you know uh yeah. and um because they're no known for that trickster element they're also known to be you know kind loving you know uh spirit beings or plasma beings and what have you but they're also known to be sort of like us right they sort of share our our different emotional um uh, wavelengths and what have you so um i don't know there's so many different variations and possibilities in this field it's unreal i you know when we originally started the podcast i had my mindset nope this is real this is what i'm going to focus on and the more i talk to people the more i realize that i know nothing about this phenomenon it just keeps getting crazier and crazier uh, for for your experience that you had, I, we don't need to get into it, but um, basically, was that a one-off for you and your wife? Was Is it something that like you think might reoccur, or is this a one-time thing? And did you remember all the event, or did you have to basically let everybody else go through therapy to get the whole information? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it wasn't necessarily a one-off. Um, uh, uh, my wife... His family has a history of um, associating associations with this phenomenon without getting into too detail. Her mother, my wife's mother, uh, and some of the some of her relatives um, are familiar with this phenomenon. Right. I'll leave it at that. On my side, um, my mother my mother was Italian and, you know, Italian American, but nevertheless, you know, she spoke Italian fluently. I'm first generation and well, I'm second generation, I should say. And, and, but she, 
had a, uh, a psychic ability and, and an ability where she was able, you know, um, you know, she would speak with my dead grandfather, for instance, you know, either on the telephone or sometimes in conversations, my father would catch her at, at night, you know, in Italian, <laughs> if you can imagine that, right. So there's a little bit of that. Um, I, uh, but my wife and I, when we got married, we moved into a, um, a few years after we did, we went, moved to Virginia, bought a house in 1990, and it was situated on a uh, old Civil War encampment, and previous to that, in, uh, a Native American encampment. And um, but we clearly had poltergeists in the house, and um, my wife and I are both open-minded and you know sort of fun-loving and amiable. We didn't ever never had kids or anything like that. But my wife's a psychologist, and to her, uh, you know, we we just we just sort of said, well, okay, you know. You, you know, things are moving around here, or, you know, um, you know, you close the door to the bedroom at night and then the footsteps start and then toilets flush and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And you know, initially we put it, well, the house is old, built in 54. And, but then afterwards it was, it was getting to be ridiculous. I mean, you know, we would come home, I would pick her up from the air. She traveled a lot, pick her up in the airport. Her slippers would be dangling on, on the stairs going to the bedroom. I sure as hell didn't do it. And she had been gone for a week. So yeah, uh, you, you don't know what to make of it, and um, and she had a we uh, she had uh, we well, both did had a couple experiences with this poltergeist activity, which was not uh, bad at all. It was actually very touching and tender uh, when we found out um, more of the history of the people that lived in the house before we did. And uh, but uh, and then this thing happened to us, uh, uh, and my wife doesn't remember anything of it except the aftermath. Um, I uh, remembered vividly uh, the initial part of it in full technicolor. Uh, I, I wasn't on a ship or anything like that. It was just all, you know, is in my bedroom in my house and then outside of the house. And then there were snippets, you know, like video clips, you know, of this very, very, um, uh, real i it was it was as real as me talking to you uh however real that is right and uh so to me it was not um i mean i know what hypnagogic states are and i know what liminal states are and uh i had experiences you know the, the mare riding me in my chest <coughs> a lot of guys do so i knew this was uh, you know as about a real event as i could possibly know what real means and uh it was later on too i also found out that other friends of mine in the intelligence community went through this similar stuff oh wow uh so uh uh but after the, all that happened um i did have my last experience was probably three years ago four years ago i can't remember the exact date when the best man of my wedding was the director of public affairs uh back when we were very young officers in the CIA, uh, Mark Mansfield, a wonderful guy. And um, he was uh, very sick and he was down in Miami teaching uh, for the CIA, teaching a, a course at the University of Miami. And, but he was very sick and we were going to go down there to see him the next day to, because he had just been admitted to the hospital and we knew he wasn't going to make it. And um, that night, um, well, that morning, I should say about two in the morning, you know, as men of my age usually do, we got, I got up to go to the bathroom and, uh, I, um, uh, went back into bed and, and while I was gone, my wife stole all my covers. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in the bed and I'm moving the covers around, you know, and grumbling a little bit and totally wide awake. And all of a sudden through the bedroom wall, there was a window there, but right sort of next to the window, this black I don't know, a uh, thing came through. And uh, now I'm one of the biggest scaredy cats known to man. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. frightened by almost everything. You scare me all the time. And this thing goes through and I wasn't the least bit afraid. I, I just couldn't get over it. I, and, and, and what it looked like was, remember the Dementors from Harry Potter? Yeah. Okay. I cut them in half, take the bottom part, throw them out. And it's it's a, hood, it's a hooded figure, right? A typical hooded figure. Messengers, you know, that's essentially what they are. It came through. And it was staring at the bathroom door where I just come out. And I'm sitting there and he's it's probably five feet from me, right? And it's just billowing there, you know, with this black billowy thing and with this hood, it's very remarkable. And then it's staring that way toward the bathroom door. And then all of a sudden it must have re realized he's not in there anymore. Turned around and faces me. No face, it's just black, right? With the hood. 
And it's just looking at me and I'm looking at it just for maybe 10 or 15 seconds. And then it just backs up and fades right out. Now, think about this for a second. Under normal circumstances, my hands would be in the air, you know, my hair would turn even whiter than it, when it is. I would be screaming bloody, bloody murder, right? I, I, it was what Robert Hastings calls the meh response. It's like, this stuff happens to you and you're like, meh, you know, and that's exactly what happened. I didn't want, meh, meh. So I wake, wake my wife, nah, I gotta wake her up. She needs to go to sleep, yeah. I went to bed. Next morning, telephone rings, get up. Uh, a buddy of mine at the agency calls me out and said, Mark died last night around two o'clock. Mm. So now you can draw all kinds of inferences, you know, uh, on what that might've meant. You know, he's a mess. It was a messenger thing or was maybe it's trying to tell me Mark, Mark passed, you know? Um, and, uh, what was really funny when, it, what, so actually when it happened, I, um, this, this group I belong to, you know, uh, that's being medically looked after. Um, I called the primary physician and I said, this is what happened. And he immediately said, uh, you have to attempt to contact this. This is this was their attempt to contact you. You have to go back and try to make contact. I laughed and I said, there's no way in hell am I going to try to contact <laughs> a hooded figure. I'm not going to contact this thing. I don't want anything to do with this thing. And, you know, people say to me all the time, why don't you, you know, I was invited up to the Monroe Institute, you know, to, uh, uh, Chris, Chris was there Bledsoe was there and some other people and John Alexander to you know try to see if they could make contact with that and I said that's not for me you know I'm not I'm not built like that I you know I'm not tethered to reality enough anyway let alone try to go that far and this is something I will warn people about uh too you know playing around with Ouija boards and and uh and trying to make these connections without having a very very strong foundation and without having a guide don't do it you yeah. don't know what you're getting into. You don't know what what um, what lower order or higher order being you're going to meet. And if you meet a higher order being, all oh, well, that's wonderful. But if you meet a lower order entity, it's not so good. Yeah. Have you it's found so Have you found that spiritually, because uh, you were mentioning esoteric um, before, have you found that spiritually you've been more awakened since the experience? Because no, we found no, out I've to be. No, no, no? I, I, okay. no, I've had a strong, I'm not religious in the least. Um, um, I used to call myself an atheist, I, I, but I, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I, I think realistically, um, I'm an agnostic and agnostic in the sense that um, what I do, what I do believe, it's, it's not so much what I know, because I don't think we can know anything anyway. What I, uh, what I believe, what I hope to be true is that there is um, um, an energy pattern we tr transition into when we pass since matter can neither be created nor destroyed. I mean, we, we're all energy patterns and, you know, I'm talking to two energy patterns right here. What's holding you can uh, together, what makes you congeal into Jason and Louis, you know, is, is, you know, physical forces like gravity and then maybe the strong nuclear force or whatever it's holding you, holding those atoms all together to turn you into who you are or what you look like. But, but in the end, I mean, you're all just this mass of energy. You're spinning electrons and neutrons and, and, you know, and protons, and you're just flying all over the place. And that's really who you are. And, and, uh, and we, we're connecting right now, even though we're at a great distance. And this is quantum, quantum theory, right? Yeah. And so you look at that and you say, well, okay, well, how does hell does that go away? I mean, you know, if you're made out of energy, you know, your physical body may go, but yeah. maybe the energy pattern doesn't go and it goes someplace else. And this is one of the big things no one's ever explained to me. And, and you know, when people ask you, you know, what's your cosmology? I mean, what do you, what, what do you truly believe? And uh, I, 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 say, I say, I don't know, because, you know, as John Alexander pointed out to me once many years ago, he said he believes or he thinks that all these psychic phenomena, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, remote viewing, um, uh, you know, UAPs, you know, the abductions, contacts, and everything like, are probably all connected in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. But no one's got a unifying theory yet uh, about what that may be. And I do think, I lean heavily towards thinking that they are indeed 
related in some form, but I just don't know what how, how that is. Yeah, because even when we interviewed uh, George Knapp um, and, and talked and Colm Kelleher as well, um, they were mentioning about the Skinwalker Ranch and the, all these different things that are taking place for people. You know, they see UFOs, they see uh, cryptids, and it seems to be all mixed in. And again, like I mentioned, when uh, you know talking to these people have opened up my mind to saying, okay, this is a possibility because I was so close minded before on certain topics, especially the cryptids. I did not know much about it. Louis actually educated me quite a bit on it. Um, and learning from other guests have been on. So I'm starting to understand that the phenomenon is bigger than, uh, you know, just UFOs in the skies. Like there seems to be other stuff that has taken place as well that needs to be considered. Like you mentioned Jacques Vallée, he mentions that very much so in his work that, uh, you know, every book he has just keeps opening up my mind to different possibilities uh, that, you know, we don't know what we're dealing with, right? Uh, but it's right. great to know that you know, people within the community, uh, in central intelligence community, uh, DOD and stuff like that are experiencers as well, because that's that's important, right? That's something that I think this closure is coming from is from the people like yourself, sir, that are coming out and saying, hey, I'm an experiencer and I used to work in the CIA for crying out loud, right? Yeah, uh, you know, and and you, you'd be surprised. I mean, uh, how many people in the community? I mean, you know, uh, Jacques used to refer to them, uh, you know, as the invisible college, you know. Um, um, there are organizations, look at SCU, Society for uh, no, Scientific Community. For UAP studies, yeah. I mean, these are mostly, you know, scientists and, and many of them are experiencers. And uh, I, you know, I, you, I mean, how, I mean, you know, the, these are very, very smart individuals. And uh, a lot of my friends who work in the community, you know, in the intelligence community that are experiencers also, it's, um, I, I don't, you know, I don't, no matter how strange uh, and how absurd their um, experiences are. The, I mean, Jacques explained to me, he said, you know, because I had this really heart to heart talk with him. I was, I was worried as I started to explain this to people, you know, particularly with the government, some of the government people, uh, what happened to me. Uh, I, I told Jacques, I said, I, I don't want to come off saying, you know, uh, this happened to me, you know, this, you know, and come out full force. I said, cause I, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah. I don't know where to put it. I, I said, I've never had an experience like this. It doesn't fit into anything that I know. And I said, um, and I asked him what, what he thought. And he, he said, look, this is extraordinarily complex. He says, we don't know. I, we don't know what to think about it. Um, um, he, uh, you know, uh, you know, John Keel in Operation Trojan Horse, and I've mentioned this before, he has a wonderful chapter on what he thinks is going on, but he, he basically calls it, you know, a paraphysical phenomenon, and he, he likes to refer to it as, as a cosmic joke, is that there, there, are, there, are, there, are this, there are these entities or there's, there's this intelligence that exists around us in a space around us perhaps in another dimension, perhaps in just another vibrational level, but nevertheless here with us, even in this dimension, but it is a different vibrational level. And because our brain is a filtering system uh, primarily, and because, you know, our bandwidth, we can't see as much as people, as like animals can see, or we can't hear as much as something can, we're very, very small on the bandwidth, right? Yeah. And our brain doesn't allow us to basically take in what we like to call awareness with a capital A, I mean, you know, we, the idea that, you know, I'm looking at you and I see a microphone. Well, all the elements that go into the microphone makes the microphone a microphone and who made the microphone. There's so many things involved in that, that, that I, I can't possibly take that all in at the same time when I'm talking to you. But essentially that's what we're talking about here. It's just, our brains don't allow all this. And, you know, I, it's, it, that's what's frustrating about it. That's why I think, I mean, John Keel walked away from it numerous times. But if that's the case, that we're all on different vibrational levels. And these things, you know, like a tree is maybe a very low vibrational level where humans are slightly above a tree, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then these beings are really, really high, but they're able to bring themselves down. Or when you look at mystics, for instance, who perhaps get themselves 
through chanting, praying, uh, intense meditation, are able to put themselves in another state, altered state of awareness, where they're actually able to touch this, whatever this is, this other place. They can only touch it for like seconds, if anything, you know, and, and perhaps maybe a little longer. In some cases, some some I know some gurus can supposedly do that, but they're able to touch that and uh, and see it and experience it, but they can't live it because their bodies won't allow them to live in it, live in it. It's not their world. So, and it's not our world, but it is our world because as, as Dr. Kripal also points out, it's not supernatural, one word, it's supernatural, two words. You know, this is all natural. This is all, I mean, when people sort of say para paranormal, I, no, it's not. It's a part of our natural environment. We just haven't been able to pick up on for all kinds of reasons, physical reasons, you know, or, or consciousness reasons, but it's there. It's with us. Yeah. Even stating it is. A... We don't know why it's <laughs> fucking with it. I don't. <laughs> we think so too, Jim. Well said. Yes. I hope. Yeah. I apologize to the listeners out there who might be a little yeah, sensitive. We swear all the time. Oh, it's oh, all yeah, good. We, I try not friends. to do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it is fucking with us. We think so. We get equally frustrated. You know, we think we're making some headway. And, you know, uh, you mentioned Jacques Vallée. He's been on our show before and he's coming back again for our hundredth episode. But uh, I'm sure he's a man who's run his head through the wall enough times going, I'm a smart guy. Why can't I figure this out? Why is this shit driving me crazy? And it that's why we keep coming back, right? It's that eternal quest. Yeah. We don't know when we really want to know. And, uh, well, he's on the right track, and and let me tell you, I, you know, I, his new book, Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was a wonderful book, and um, what he he talks about because when I was when I talk to these UAP task force, you know, the people, uh, you know, and they tell me, you know, sort of what they're going to be doing, it's it's apparent that they don't um, they have an incredible scientific minds now. We're going to be working on this, right? But. But they're working on it through at, at really one aspect. They're trying to understand it, but you know, frankly, don't expect a lot out of them because I wouldn't expect a lot out of them at all. Even if you had a private group that was open and stuff, you're not going to get a lot out of it either. I mean, it, it's like well, we're talking here; we don't know anything, right? Yeah, there would be no different if you had you know put a hundred scientists against it. It's just you might make some headway. But what what Jacques was is doing and is uh, is this field centric model? This this idea of you have to meet it. The phenomenon on its own terms so when it shows up someplace you go where it shows up and you basically study it much, much like jane goodall studied you know the gorillas yeah. uh and the great apes and you know you have to go to their environment and watch them and you you it's, it's anecdotes right because you see these things all the time you write it all down and then you get a scientific theory based on what you've seen okay chimpanzees gorillas do x y and z because i've seen them in the field and you know and this is what we have and then other people go in and corroborate that and you have uh, you have a, a, I think a pretty decent way. That's what anthropologists do, and things a pretty decent way of, of figuring things out without using uh, the classic scientific method, right? This predictability and rel reliability, right. you know, thing going on, because this doesn't fit into that mold. Uh, the phenomena doesn't fit into that, and and uh, and we science won't allow it in. Now it is to a certain extent. Uh, I think you see more and more people wanting to get uh, involved, scientists wanting to get involved with that. But that, that's what makes it very, very difficult. Yeah. And the fact is, you may never come up with an answer. Well, you brought up a good point. The fact that you cannot repeat an experiment with UAPs or UFOs. It's not a repeatable thing. So trying to figure out, you know, scientifically what's going on is is it's impossible. Right? Yeah. 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 And, you know, and people, you know, say to me, well, you know, I, you know, they, they, they're always trying to, uh, you know, put the blame on the government. And and, and I, I get that. I really do get that. But come on. I mean, you know, the government is made out of made up of people like you and me. Right. We're all sitting here. We're all bozos on the bus. Right. We don't know what the hell's going on. And I think I, I think what, the, what what they really are saying is they want the government to come out and say this is real. Yeah. Well, the government has sort of done that in a roundabout way uh, recently, you know, in the last year. And they've come out and said, well, you know, it's um, could be Chinese, could be Russian, but it also could be this, you know, this unknown thing. Well, that was if you read a lot of intelligence 
you know, papers and stuff like I have over here. What that was, was a very, um, uh, reading between the lines, what that was saying was, yeah, it's not Chinese, not Russians, not us. This is this. That's what this is. Yeah. I mean, everybody I know in the government took it that way. All right. That what it is. And now, as a one of the things I did in CIA was was I paid attention to a lot of uh, very high tech, exotic type of military technologies around the world. I will promise you there is no Chinese or Russian or or U.S. versions of the Tic Tac don't exist. Yeah. They just don't exist. And um, so it's something else. Yeah. And anybody like- who tries to tell you otherwise is full of beans. I mean, it's just absolutely full of beans. Uh, and, and this is why when we started TTSA, I mean, we, we it all came to this mutual understanding. We are never going to defend this. We're never going to go talk to people um, uh, about this. Um, and, you know, from the, from, the, from the viewpoint that we're trying to explain to them or convince them of anything. We're beyond that. It's just, no, this is real. We know it's real. The evidence is is extraordinary. And the evidence is overwhelming. We're just trying to find a theory that fits the evidence. That's all we're trying to do. But please, you know, I, that's why even some podcasts I always ask you guys I knew about a little bit that uh, you know don't don't try to get me in an argument about this. I'm not. I don't want to argue with it. I'm too yeah. old. You know, it's real. Yeah. yeah, you know what you know after so many years of researching and talking to people you know that may not go on camera but you know their credentials you know they're not nuts if they're telling you it's a or b you're probably going to believe them because they have credibility right right yeah. Yeah. you think you're going to write a, a book like um i know that you, you write books you're you're uh you're, you're a fan of reading obviously but uh, your experience i mean it's it's private and you, like you said you don't really talk much about it but do you think there will come a day where Maybe you put that all into some sort of book, um, and no, no, I'm not a book guy. no, no. I, you, know, you know, a lot of my friends in CIA have written books, and uh, some of them are very, very good. And um, I, I'm just not. I, I I don't have the patience to write a book, um, I, nor I don't think I have the mental facility to actually write a book. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And and um, I think you have to be very clever, and I, I'm not really what I would call clever kind of guy, but um, eventually though, I will tell, I will tell the full story, uh, completely. I'm, uh, actually, uh, it's either going to come out through my company or through, um, a journalist friend of mine. Uh, and, but I wanted to have, uh, a little bit of impact, um, you know what I mean? When it does come out. So, uh, you know, where, where. It's not just me, it's maybe somebody else and there's evidence. And I, I do have, of course, I mean, I have data that I can point to, you know, right. and I do have that. So, um, you know, the people out there are saying, oh, you ought to talk about it. You ought to talk. Well, yeah, I will. Eventually uh, I'm going to. But it, it's like when when TTSA came out and then the New York Times, you know, did the front page story right on 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 the uh, loose program. I mean, that was all set up, um, you know, uh, by Leslie Kane and we, it was me and Lou and Chris um, and Hal met with Leslie um, in the lobby of the Ritz Carlton in 20, was it, tw- late 2016, I believe it was. And we, you know, explained everything to her. And she was like, oh, okay. You know, and, you know, and she got together with Ralph Blumenthal and then Helene, Helen, I uh, can't remember her last name. And they were they had to sell this to the editor, right? The editor yeah. who did not want to do this. But eventually, um, once they once they basically got a hold of their sources at the Pentagon and basically said, Yeah, this is true, then it was all over with. Then when it hit hit and we were all nervous as hell because you know, we um even though we, everything was done according to, you know, I mean, we I mean, Lou followed protocol like exactly. And um, um, and uh, and then Chris followed protocol that they were, you know, the films were given to Chris. And um, and I remember none of us. I mean, Chris was sort of orchestrating some of this because he didn't want he didn't want it, you know, anything to be leaked or anything to come out. He wanted to make sure it was done legally and everything was done properly. And so we just everybody sort of just sort of backed off and let let it handle the way it went out. But um, um we knew then that that was it. And it was the right time to do it. But here you have guys like George Knapp, who's been doing this for like 40 years, right? And 
yeah, I think he he was the first guy I think he put out the Tic Tac video. I mean, he this is the guy who's been doing yeah. this kind of stuff. Him, Jock Valet, all these guys. I mean, you know, and all of a sudden this comes out and it, it, it looks like, you know, the, you know, that Lou and the TTSA team, you know, were the team, you know, with sort of like the turning point. It may have been a turning point, but the, honest to God, you stand on the uh, shoulders of giants. You know, these guys were giant and they are giants. So I'm, I'm extraordinarily deferential to them all, you know, because we owe so much to all of them. You know, and George over- mentioned that when he was on our show, he said that him and Colin Kelleher and Jim Lekatsky and, They've been working on this since, like you said, the time of NIDS and oh. all the rest. They were constantly in touch. But his overwhelming impression was that they wanted it to come through a recognizable figure like Tom DeLong, no. um, And they wanted it to be measurable. Like nowadays, everything is metric based. It's click based. It's view times and duration and all the rest. So if it came out from a lesser known party, maybe it wouldn't have got the same impact as if it comes out from Tom DeLong. So he was yeah. happy that it was released, but I, I could sense there was a little bit of that. Ah, I had the story. I should have been the he guy. Did. He had it. He had it. He had it cold. They had yeah. it cold. George in particular. I mean, he, yeah. he's just, he's like the guy, right? And, um, and uh, you know, you, you sort of feel bad about that. But, you know, when the history gets written, I mean, he's going to have a prominent role, I oh. mean, in all of this. I mean, yeah. it's just, uh, because he did. He played a prominent role in this. He, you know, him, Jock Vallee, Colm. All those guys, like Kasky, you know, uh, these guys uh, are the ones, you know, Richard Dolan, you know, and another fellow I've never met, but really respect his work. I have all his books here. I read them all. Don't agree with a, some of this stuff, but but uh, I mean, some of his uh, conclusions he might have drawn towards the end, but I, you know, but that's, that's okay. I mean, I understand them, but I think he did an absolutely extraordinary job of getting this all down. Uh, and he did it really, really well. He's a true. And then Robert Hastings, who, you know, who, who I consider to be, you know, almost like a, 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 a sort of a god in all of this. I mean, his seminal work, you know, UFOs and nukes. It just to me is this probably one of the best books ever written on the subject. And um, it was a book that was passed around in D- Department of Defense and in CIA and uh, other places and still is is used as a reference book. Um, and, uh, we let him know that. And, uh, and I, he's, I think he's very appreciative that his, his book was actually, uh, is seen as like, you know, the, cause he's such a great writer and, uh, yeah. a true, a true, true journalist. So. Oh, that's the way to do it is to, to, to point out, you know, everybody has a role to play in this. Uh, one of the questions that I have is in your personal experience or your professional, um, opinion, should this be an issue that is regulated? Like we have something, you know, in Canada, we have something in the States, we have something that's happening in, in Japan, I think has their own organization as well now that they're investigating UAP. Should there be a global uh, connection at some point? Like, should we all work together as countries to, towards this? Because I think it's all individualistic right now. It's all every country for themselves on this topic. Uh, do do you think that this is something that might be approached later on as a global issue, or is it still going to be sort of compartmentalized uh, within each other's countries? Both. Both. Uh, yeah, both. And 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 uh, in general, um, what we need is each country has a um, a group set up that deals with this. Right that is funded either, uh, you know, uh, how it's funded, it, it, you know, privately funded and or, and or publicly funded. Um, uh, it doesn't have a quarterly review that you have to produce anything because you're not going to produce anything with this, literally for the next first four or five years, you just, and it's going to take that long just to set up and get everything, all the databases straightened out. And, um, and, and like I said, a lot of this is beyond our ken anyway. We don't have the technology to fully understand it, even to investigate it. Um, so it's going to take time. But nevertheless, we should have that. And I think if we actually did that, I think other countries would follow suit. And then, yes, we should be exchanging information on an unclassified level. Now, let me tell you what the what the problematic part with all this stuff is. Um, it, it, any government that's out there worth their salt is you know they're always looking to preserve their system of government their form of government 
their governmental structure. I mean, you might look at North Korea, right? And and really, well, all that is the thugocracy, right? It's just a bunch of thugs, mm-hmm. you know, running. Uh, Russia is pretty much the same thing, you know, with some mafia, you know, with um, some corrupt uh, politicians and what have you. So they need they want to stay in power. So what they're going to do is anything they can weaponize to give them leverage, they'll do. So let's say that the United States, you know, has hypothetically can, you know, has a down craft uh, uh, and is been looking at this craft and can't figure out how the hell it works, but nevertheless has thrown enough scientists and money at it to figure out, you know, maybe looking at the comp- how this thing is, you know, built in, or, you know, the composite materials, and they were able to figure something out and maybe they got the C or D version of this now, right? They were able to reverse engineer to a much, much lower level. But nevertheless, a level that might be an order of magnitude greater than what they currently have. Right. So they don't, they're not going to take this technology and they're not going to give it to the world. I mean, they're going to say, look what we found, you know, I mean, it's free energy. They're not going to do that because what happens is once you do that, uh, um, that type of technology then becomes ubiquitous and governments that may not be, you know, well, who have, you know, interests inimical to your own may use that against you. I mean, the world's a nasty, nasty place. I mean, when I, in CIA, that's one of the things I took out of it was, you know, the uh, the arc of justice and the arc of morality, I think is it really does flow towards the right and the good. It, it really does. But it's a very, very small arc. It's not this great big arc. That's good. You have some nasty, nasty people out there. Yeah. And uh, they would love to see, they would nothing love better than, you know, to foment revolution and pain and agony and war. So, so, so you want to keep technologies away from them. And the only way you do that is to keep them compartmentalized and classified. That's just a state of affairs. I, 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 I would hope that we figured out a way to have free energy and give it to everybody. But you know what's going to happen to that. And they're going to, someone's going to weaponize it. Right. It's this whole idea of, you know, like, for instance, a do-it-yourself bio, you know, these biopunks who basically were able to hack into, they're able to buy little strains of chromosomes and DNA and then put together something. It's really only a matter of time before some English major uh, with a, a knack for, you know, biology is going to put together, you know, something that resembles uh, smallpox or AIDS and able to put it into a flu virus and then, you know, decide he's going to take out, you know, uh, uh, you know, half the United States, you know, and by infecting five or six people, putting them on airplanes and off they go. I mean, that, those kind of scenarios are actually, you know, real. And they, they're maybe not quite yet, but really in the next three or four or five years, that this is going to be doable. So, th- like I said, the world is a dangerous place. So if you look, if you're the United States government or the Russian government, you know, what you're kind of do is you're having to keep what you may know about this, um, uh, that, gives you an advantage particularly militarily over another country you're really not going to want to share that and you really want to you're really going to want to compartmentalize it and make sure nobody has that so that's the problem so when japan comes over to the united states and says you know tell me everything you know about (laughs) ufos and the phenomenon i mean you know they can go to the private organization and we can we can give them that you know uh, but they go to the military and the military no we're not going to do that yeah. You what know, we'll tell you, maybe we'll share some data with you. But we're not going to share all the data with you. Now, you know, there's Five Eyes. You know, uh, you're familiar with Five Eyes. Uh, five Eyes is a, is an intelligence relationship that exists between the United States, Canada, uh, Great Britain, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. They share an enormous amount of information uh, with one another. Um, and so, would there be sharing of information between? five eyes and you know on this particular topic probably to a certain extent they don't share everything with them but they share quite a bit um so yeah so i think that's what the problem is is it fair to all us all of the people out there really want to know what the hell's going on no no um but you can make a very strong argument that you really don't you don't want to take that information necessarily and put it all out there right so it's just a threat. It's just it could does be. That, does that make sense to you, or am yeah. I am I all wet? I mean, I could be no, all wet. No, absolutely. it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mean, people have good intentions and bad intentions with everything, and if it's groundbreaking technology, you know, there's some people that just want to make it for their own purpose, and that may be an evil one. Yeah, if there was a way, I, I, I mean, you, I mean, if you if you had Plato or Socrates, you know, in this conversation, 
there were two more squares here and they were all, we, we would have a wonderful conversation about this because you know they they were philosophers you know and um they they understood this i mean you know they were first rate minds they would fit right in with this type of topic area the only thing that would separate them from us is technology is in the sense that they wouldn't know what a hell an iphone was or a microphone or or this it would be magic to them in a way but nevertheless the foundations uh, uh and what they talked about truth and justice you know and morality um yeah, we can easily have a conversation with them in the 21st century about that today. Um, but on technology, we can't. And our, the problem is, is we, technology has moved so quickly that, um, and, and we have not really moved as quickly in the realms of goodness, morality, and uh, ethical behavior as I think we should have as human beings. I think the bulk of human beings are moral, have a decent moral and ethical center. You know, but ooh, look what's going on in the United States. I mean, this divide we have now, uh, all this disinformation that's out there, and um, it's awful. And yeah. uh, by a former president who keeps putting it out there, and uh, I, it's, I, I don't know whether you're Republican or Democrat. I generally team lean towards Democrat, but but it, it's, uh, you know, I, it's you can't you can't do that. It, it, yeah. It's it's just it's it's it really damages, you know. Uh, it damages the public will. It, it damages everything. It's it's really unethical behavior, and it shouldn't go on. But this is what happens, and this is happening around the globe. Now, hopefully, it'll get better. You know, so got to hang in there. That's the only thing that we can do as a species. But yeah, you mentioned, um, you know, our talking with philosophers. As a species, we really haven't evolved much from the medieval age. I mean, we uh, just got better technology to kill more people, but our ideas and, you know, concepts of killing other people, devaluing somebody else's life and stuff like that, or another country's purpose, uh, we've always done that. And I don't think that's going to end anytime soon. And with uh, disclosure being what it is, I don't think it's going to bring the countries together. If you're saying, hey, we're being visited by something from somewhere else, would that unite the planet? I think, uh, what was his name? Um, I was going to say Rogan. It's not Rogan. Reagan, uh, the president, he once mentioned that at a UN meeting. He says, I will right. often wonder if, uh, you know, if we were being attacked from a night south source, if we would come together as a, as a species. And I, I often thought that too. Like maybe that's what we need is we need to have some sort of fear of something to be able to unite us to progress but because right now we're we're just a hot mess like you mentioned the states it's a hot mess right now um and we hope to get back on track anyways uh with this closure is is the main thing i think we're all being distracted right now with uh donald trump and all that but the government literally came out and said ufps are real ufos are real and yeah. it didn't okay. make much of a boom at all in within the media there's a few places that have caught on like uh tucker carlson is is you know hosting people all the time few cnn things but uh it really hasn't boomed as much as i thought it was going to be i mean to me it was a huge shock but well this is not uh, you know i i like to remind people and well i said this right before we went we, on we live in a very small bubble uh this ufo phenomenon bubble uap phenomenon bubble and um, we like to think, you know, that it's it's the hottest topic. I, I always tell people it's the story of the millennium. Yeah. Why, why aren't you jumping up and down? I mean, why aren't people jumping up and down? And going, oh, my God, you know, we're not alone. And, and this is how are we going to fit this in? And how are we going to handle this? Nobody cares. Uh, I was at a, a party the other night. And um, um, all, almost everybody there had a Ph.D. or J.D. or something along those lines or advanced degrees and. We were talking about this. Uh, it, the subject came up, but it was very clear that, A, nobody knew anything about it. Um, people still thought it was sort of a jokey kind of thing. Um, and these are, you know, extraordinarily bright people. And But outside of our little group, it's not, this is not on anybody's top 50 list, let alone top 10 list. Nobody gives a damn. Um, I've had people come down to this little room of mine, you know, look at all this, this stuff. I mean, you know, jaws drop a little bit and what the hell are you reading? And, you know, and I, and I, so, you know, I, 
I always attempt to engage them in it, you know, but usually within the first few minutes, you realize I'm not the least bit interested. Their eyes glaze over when you start talking about it. Um, so, uh, you know, th this, until we get what, what I like to call, um, you know, you know, the brick wall falling on somebody's head, you know, the, the definitive kind of incident, right, where a, a craft you know, makes itself known to a large amount of people, um, uh, you know, and it can be it, it photographed and what have you, um, you know, there, I mean, it, where it was, it's apparent, very clear what has happened. Until that happens, nothing's going to happen. Right now, we have all this radar data. We actually have pictures. Pictures are not going to come out, I don't think, or may come out. I don't know. Uh, but the point is, is it's not going to happen until until that happens. So whose problem is it? Yeah. Well, I always like to say, you know, you know, you can, what we end up doing is blaming ourselves, right? We blame the government. We blame, you know, uh, you know, I'm sitting here going, you know, yapping about most people don't give a damn about it. It's a story millennia, but, but, but really the, it's, it's, it's the phenomenon's fault, you know, screw that, you know, screw them. They come yeah. into your bedroom. They come over your car you know they're the ones causing all this shit they're the ones and, and all they're doing is waving at us right and flipping us the middle finger because essentially you know they're they're basically saying look we're here we're here we'll, we'll give you this i mean you, you can you can catch us we'll let you get close but not too close is what i, I told robert hastings once i said you know they're, they're, they tease you cajole you you know they uh, deceive you uh they, they'll do anything you know say anything do anything but they'll never introduce themselves to your parents <laughs> and um they just won't and and you know so uh, i i look at them and you know i look at this whole thing and i said well you know i try not to get mad at anybody i don't get you know people come up with these weird ideas of what this might be i said yeah okay that's it's understandable because the phenomena doesn't isn't giving us anything it's been doing this for two thousand years since recorded history more than two thousand years it's been playing with us and it plays and this is why john keel made that statement it's a damn cosmic joke right. i mean it's, it's they're deceitful you know whatever the hell they are they're doing it on purpose they're just banging us around a little bit so now it gives you guys you know a little raison d'etre right because you know you get, you get this great little podcast you have you know and you get you get you get little little morons like me on here let's yak 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 about all this kind of stuff but we don't come up with anything um i don't think so i, I don't know um we're trying to. We're still trying to find the needles in the haystack. We're still trying to figure out the signal from the noise. Somebody once mentioned to me, you know, we we haven't connected the dots, and I said, I don't even know if there's any dots, let alone trying to connect them. I said, what dot is there? You know, yeah. there, there's some. You know, Jock pointed this out. He said, there's there's a lot of stability in in some of the experiences that people have. You know, you you can write down six or seven things that always pretty much always happen. But that's about it, you know, and and it's not true all the time, but it's true maybe 60, 70 percent of the time, which is pretty good. But try to extrapolate and take from that what it actually means. And, and I don't know. I hope I'm not giving you both a headache here. because no. Oh, no, yeah. we've gone through this in our own personal careers, too. Like I said earlier, you feel like you make progress. And then it's just like maybe we're just not good enough observers. Our spectrum is only so wide this all, you know, exists all around us. Maybe just biologically, we will never understand it. Maybe it's not stranger than we think. It's stranger than we can think. And we may yeah. never get there. So we yeah. have a, a, a positive outlook that we want to learn more. Do I personally believe I'll ever understand it? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I'm leaning towards the fact that I don't think in my, at least in my lifetime, maybe yours, you guys are a lot younger. You might come up with, more data uh, uh but i think in my lifetime i think i'll i'll you know i'll go on my merry way and 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 never know really even have a hint of what the hell it is that's fine you know uh uh, uh but what you know what i look at what bothers me the most i guess from a human perspective is all these experiencers and contactees uh and to a lesser extent, you know, people like you, you know, the people that are genuinely interested in this and actually spend their time researching this. But particularly the 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 uh, uh, abductees or the people that have this experience, 
that they've gone through so much, you know, psychological pain, sometimes physical pain. And, 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 and there is no explanation for them. What, what did John Mack say? John, John Mack said something along the lines of, you know, the, the most we can ever say about that, this abduction stuff is it, 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 it's a mystery. And we really shouldn't say anything more than that. In other words, there's really, cause there's nothing really more to, else to say. And, um, and it's it's sort of um, it's upsetting when you think about it. I, 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 you know, all these people that have this, and you know, many many will die without ever knowing what it was all about, uh, or they'll come to their own conclusions of you know maybe it was a way for them to become more spiritually aware. Which I think for the general population have had this generally have that, uh, but for other ones I know it's it's just it's been horrendous for them. You know, um, just horrendous experience for them. And they live with this, and they and and some of them continue to live with it. You know, they continue to have orbs bouncing around them and um, um, and toying with them. And the abduction phenomenon is 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 traumatic as well. Like it's a violation, like you mentioned, of of your human rights of everything that makes up you they're just basically saying no we now have control over this or whatever it is that they're going to do to you so that's the part that for a lot of people they have a hard time wrapping their heads around saying i had absolutely no authority over my own body like i had to do you know whatever procedures they told me to do i was complying with them like it's just it's so weird but it's great to have you know people like yourself like i mentioned saying hey this happened to me right this and, and while I was working with the CIA, so obviously, like I said, to me, it's it's great to hear because it's always something that I'm curious about. Like, do people in the CIA have experiences? Do people in the military have experiences? And it seems to be the case. It seems to be that yeah, everybody everywhere, different uh, you know industries are experiencing this phenomenon. Which again, should we call it phenomenon? More of a happening. Because that's what's happening. It's no longer a phenomenon. Phenomenons are like rare occasions. This almost takes place on a daily basis. So, yeah, I don't know if we should change it or not. But um, Louis, do you have any final questions for our guest today? No, I just want to extend a really sincere thanks to Jim. Uh, you know, it's been enlightening for us. It's uh, it's difficult to run a type of show like this and get really credible guests and uh, guys of your caliber. There just aren't many of and open minded enough to not be too opinionated. You know, we uh, we like to tell people that we bring forth the guest. You form your own opinion, We're not necessarily sharing our ideas, but it's their own. But uh, in today's case, in today's episode, we you know wholeheartedly agree with everything you've said. Um, you know, you've dedicated your life to protecting the country, but now you want to help people understand what the hell this actually is. And you could easily be, I'm sure, sitting in Boca Raton, drinking a a drink with a, a, a yeah. an umbrella in it and just say, you know what, not for me, I'm retired. But you still have that drive and you have that that wanting to find out. And it's refreshing even for younger guys as ourselves and people younger than us without you guys in this movement and to the stars and Tom DeLong and Hal Putoff and all the rest. This wouldn't have got where it is right now. And I think in the last five years, because of that Tic Tac video and all the work that went behind the scenes, we all know more about this and there are more people informed. So, yeah. so thank you for doing what you do. We do appreciate it. It doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, some of us know exactly who you are and couldn't wait to talk to you. So, Oh, that's Thanks very nice. I hope I didn't let you down and I enjoyed it immensely. And uh, if you ever want me back, you guys are anytime, great. anytime. Yeah, I, love I'm Canadians. I love the bring your friends, here. bring Tom and Hal with you next time. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we, we can do that. Absolutely. Tom's We're really friendly creatures. Right yeah, so. We can do that. Right. Hey, listen, guys, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it.